he has shown mercy, the mercy promised to our ancestors, and has remembered his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our ancestor Abraham, to grant us that we, that we, being rescued from the hands of our enemies, might serve him without fear, in holiness and righteousness, before him all our days. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people by the forgiveness of their sins. By the tender mercy of our God, the dawn from on high will break upon us, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Expectation was replaced with anxiety that came 
sitting with wondering how I could possibly fit one more event into an already crazy schedule. Each year was a challenge to keep consumerism and overindulgence at bay while holding fast to the true meaning of Advent. A time of waiting, watching, and anticipating the coming of Messiah. As God's people, there's often tension between what we see and what we should see. The world as it really is and the world as God wants it to be. While we participate in the joyous festivities and celebrations, we acknowledge that the world continues to be filled with hurting and broken people. People throughout the world living in darkness. People subjected to war, violence, poverty, and oppression. Vulnerable adults and children abused by those who are supposed to love and care for them. People who feel overlooked or insignificant, wondering if their lives matter to anyone. People suffering from insurmountable problems and challenges. Lives that are diminished by difficult bosses and colleagues. Strained relationships. Lives threatened by, to be destroyed by addictions. People tormented by grief, loneliness, or depression. Individuals longing for something deeper than gifts and parties. People eagerly awaiting Christ's coming when all of God's promises will be fulfilled. The lives of those living during the time of Jesus' birth were similar to ours in many ways. There were wars, misery, excessive taxation, injustice, and oppression. For hundreds of years, prophets predicted the coming Messiah, and they fervently looked for his arrival. In the Psalms, King David sang about the coming Messiah. Jeremiah preached to the people, saying, The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to Israel and Judah. I will cause a righteous branch to spring up from David's line. Then Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. The prophet Isaiah also proclaimed the joy of the coming Messiah. There will be no more gloom for those who were in anguish. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and light has shined on those who lived in the land of deep darkness. The people rejoice because you have broken their burden and freed them from their oppressor. A child has been born, a son given to us, and there shall be endless peace. The people eagerly awaited the one who would be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Then the time finally came. One day, when Zechariah, a priest, was serving in the temple, an angel named Gabriel appeared. Naturally, Zechariah was terrified and overwhelmed with fear. Don't be afraid, Gabriel said. I've come to tell you that your wife, Elizabeth, will become pregnant and have a son. Zechariah and Elizabeth were in their 70s or 80s, well beyond childbearing years. Learning that I was going to have my very first child at that age would frighten me more than seeing an angel. <laughs> Gabriel explained that the child's name would be John. There would be joy and gladness. Many people would rejoice at his birth. He would be great in God's eyes. Even before his birth, he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. His spirit and power would turn many people to God. John's purpose in life would be to prepare the people for Messiah. That meant that the Messiah was finally coming to save God's people. Think about the excitement and the anticipation of that first Christmas. But Zechariah couldn't believe what he had heard. I'm an old man, and my wife is no spring chicken either. How will I know what you are saying is true? Gabriel was displeased with 
Zechariah's doubt, and as a consequence, Zechariah was unable to speak until the day when the prophecy was fulfilled. Plenty of time for him to wait, watch, and anticipate. We can't blame Zechariah for questioning Gabriel. We do it all the time. While we desperately want God's promises to be true, there are many things that interfere and stand in the way of believing that they will be fulfilled anytime soon. It's been over 2,000 years and Christ hasn't returned yet, so why would we think that he come during our lifetime? Somewhere along the way, we stop expecting his return. We focus on worldly festivities and gift-giving instead of looking for God's signs of mercy and love. A seminary professor told this story about a fishing trip with his son. It was one of those days when the fish weren't biting, so he and his son had lots of time to talk. While sitting there, his son asked, Dad, what do you think is the toughest thing God ever tried to do? The question caught him off guard, and like most professors, he answered his son's question with a question. What do you think it was? He asked his son. And his son replied, at first I thought that creating the world might be the hardest thing God ever did. Then in Sunday school, we talked about miracles and Jesus' resurrection, and I thought, that might be the hardest thing God ever did. But the more I thought about it and the more I talked about it with others, I decided that no one really knows God very well. And they have trouble believing that God loves them. So now I think the hardest thing God ever tried to do was to get us to understand who God is and how much God loves us. The father simply said, son, I think you're right. That is the hardest thing God ever tried to do. And there was only one way he could do that. God came to us in human form to show us love. As we feast and celebrate these next couple of weeks, remember that Advent is a time of waiting, watching, and anticipating Christ's return when the mercy of our God will break upon us to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace, and to show us how much God loves us. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Covenant God, you send us messengers to cleanse and refine us for your coming. Help us endure the prophet's message that we may see you when you suddenly appear among us.